Titanic is the most famous naval disaster in history. The Lusitania, lost just off the coast of Ireland in the First World War, was influential in swinging American opinion against the German U-boat campaign. The mighty Hood blew up under fire in the Denmark Straits, engaging the, the Bismarck. Now, these naval catastrophes are etched both in the public consciousness and the military record. And yet, the greatest naval disaster in British history, where the loss of life was greater than the Titanic, the Lusitania and the Hood combined, is barely remembered at all. For it is here, just a few miles off the port of Saint-Nazaire in Brittany, that on the 17th of June 1940, the Lancastria was sunk with a minimum loss of over 4,000 souls, both civilian and military. And so in two special programmes for Remembrance Day, we chart the history of the Lancastria. We speak to the last few remaining survivors. We speak to the relatives of those who perished and those who survived. We speak to the campaigners about their long struggle for remembrance. And we try to answer the question of why the greatest naval disaster in British history has been confined to the hidden vaults of history. You know, they say the, the sea is cruel but perhaps not quite as cruel as those who have denied remembrance to so many for 78 long years. In June 1940, Prime Minister and war leader Winston Churchill faced huge strategic problems, but had grasped a glimmer of light in the otherwise totally bleak military landscape. France was on its knees and had crumbled in the face of the Nazi onslaught in a matter of days. The British forces were a beaten army, evacuated in chaos and confusion from the beaches of Dunkirk. However, by a combination of luck and bravery, much of the expeditionary force had escaped intact, running away but surviving to fight another day. To their great surprise, this broken, chastened army returned to a hero's reception. For Churchill, in a series of oratorical triumphs, had snatched the illusion of victory from the reality of defeat. But barely two weeks after Dunkirk, and on the very day of the official French surrender, news came through of a further devastating naval loss. Churchill was told about the loss of the Lancastria, a news story that no amount of spin could present as anything other than an unmitigated and bloody catastrophe. And so the Prime Minister decided that this was one disaster too many to be reported. No mention of the loss was made by either newspapers or radio. Surviving soldiers and seamen were ordered to keep quiet. It was as if the Lancastria was still afloat and the 4,000 dead were still alive. I pick up the story with two campaigners who have fought to restore the memory of the fate of the Lancastria. I'm now delighted to be joined by Mark Hurst, a long-term Lancastria campaigner, and Michel Uxeby, uh, a local historian here in Saint-Nazaire. Mark, if I, I can come to you first, what was the Lancastria doing here in, in Saint-Nazaire that fateful day in June 1940? Well, the Lancastria had been commissioned as a troop ship at the outbreak of war, and uh, she was actually just finished um, the di disembarkation of troops from the Norway campaign when she got orders to sail to Saint-Nazaire and help in the evacuation. So she was a Cunard liner, which was right. requisitioned as a troop carrier. Yeah, she was, uh, she was requisitioned, she, she cruised the Atlantic in, in a peacetime role, taking wealthy passengers across the Atlantic. She also did some Mediterranean cruising, uh, but the orders, when the orders came through, she was actually in Nassau in the Bahamas and was sent to New York, painted Battleship Grey, and then onwards uh, to, to the UK to take a full part in the, the war and in, in troop movements. And Michelle, you were actually around just down the road uh, in 1940 as a 10 year old boy yeah. and you witnessed the, the chaos and the confusion of the troops trying to find a way out of France and the refugees looking for somewhere to go. It was really unbelievable. It was impossible to drive on the road where they were full of refugees coming from the north of France, coming from Belgium, coming from the Netherlands. And, uh, well, it was really impossible to, to drive. So the troops and the civils, the civilian people, they did what they could do. And they had a ship going back to England and they tried to, to, to embark on the, on the ship. And I think the captain uh, well, tried to have the navigation as safe as possible. 
and he was waiting for an escort. Captain Sharp decided not to sail in the afternoon That's because right. he was waiting for a destroyer escort. He That's was frightened, obviously, of U-boats sinking it. his ship in the, in the channel. And well, it's easy now to say he made a mistake, but uh, I was a captain myself. I don't know what I, I, have, I would have done at this moment. Mark, well, of course, you have a, a family connection because yeah. your grandfather was a, aboard the Lancaster. Tell us a bit about his story, what happened to him. Well, he arrived here late on the night before the, uh, the embarkation out to the Lancaster and slept in the streets here in San Nazaire and uh, his unit were actually sent out late in the afternoon. They were one of the last units to board the Lancastria, and he actually sought refuge on the, the top deck. And because he was a non-swimmer, he spotted uh, a life jacket, but initially he didn't think it would save his life. He took the life jacket because he thought it would make a good pillow for the long journey back. But that was a fateful decision for him, obviously, because shortly afterwards the Lancastria was attacked. And your grandfather's name was? Walter Hurst. And did he speak much about in his later days? Because you obviously, you'd know him as a growing up, and did yeah. he, he tell you about what had happened that day? Well, he lived with us in the latter years of his, of his life, and he would describe what happened. And uh, when he eventually made it into the water, um, he was there, he, didn't, he wasn't a swimmer, so he tried to stay as still as possible. And uh, out of nowhere, a, a dog appeared, and he grabbed the, the scruff of the neck to pull him away from the suction of the boat. And we know this dog may well have been, from other accounts, the, the, the pet of uh, some of the Belgium children refugees That's right. who had boarded the Lancaster. Yeah, there was, it's difficult to understand, but uh, there was not just troops coming into San Nazaire, there was hundreds of refugees. Many of them, like these children, had walked all the way with their dogs. Sadly, though, we know that uh, these children who did board the Lancaster with their dogs, sadly, they, they didn't make it. But the, the dog intervention was very helpful to your grandfather. Helped my grandfather, but he was still very much haunted by what he saw. It's, it's difficult to imagine uh, what happened out there in the, in the estuary. There was many ways to die that day, and uh, I think the horror, in some ways, for the survivors was lived with them for many years. And I know from my own experience, speaking to many survivors since, that they had nightmares well into their 80s and 90s throughout their life of, about what happened. And for many years afterwards, uh, remains of, of bodies were being washed ashore. Fishermen were, were catching the, the bodies in the nets. Little nest. by little, well, they, they found some bodies, but difficult to know who, who they, they were and the hand, how many. But they are in the department of Vendée now, but uh, well, all along the coast they were. And maybe some are still down in the, in the bottom of the sea. So thank you so much, Michelle, for that first-hand account of the confusion and horror of that time. For appearing on the show, can I present you with the Alex Salmon Quake, the Quake's a loving cup. Uh, a couple of remembrance, perhaps. You know the drill. We serve the quam fair. <laughs> uh, whiskey in the quake, and only Scotch whiskey, of course. Thank you. Thank you so I much. I hope my wife will appreciate <laughs> you have to drink some whiskey here. <laughs> Happy end too. And Mark, we're going to now trace some of the history of your grandfather and how he got here on that fateful day. This is uh, Nantes uh, Atlantique Airport as is now, but back in 1940, still RAF Bougainé. But they must have had an indication that things weren't going well. I mean, Dunkirk had been evacuated, Winston Churchill had broadcast that the expeditionary force had been safely transported across the Channel. Did the, the boys think they'd been left behind? Yeah, well, in fact, on the 14th of uh, June, they were sitting not far from here listening to the BBC World Service when Winston Churchill came on and announced that the British Expeditionary Force had completely and successfully evacuated France. In fact, at that point, there was still 150,000 plus British troops still in France, still trying to evacuate. Along with many civilians, embassy staff, people who'd been on holiday perhaps. Exactly. Mixed in with refugees from Belgium, members of the, the French forces who perhaps didn't fancy a, a life under Nazi occupation. So there was a whole, uh, gatherings of people who are anxious to get out and we're about what 50 kilometers from Saint-Nazaire here. Yeah it's uh, important to point out though there was real chaos no one really knew what was going on I mean partly due to wartime censorship but the first indication the company got was when their commanding officer 
pulled them out on parade and said, prepare for evacuation. And I think that was a real shock, especially for my grandfather, because one of the reasons he had volunteered to come to France was to finish the job that his own father had, as he put it, begun in World War I. So to be now in clearly a full retreat was a shock. So they were on parade uh, on June the 16th, the day before the Lancastria went down. Uh, so lined up and said, in, enter, the, enter the trucks, boys, and we'll be uh, off the Saint Lazare and yeah. we'll be evacuated back to, back to Blighty. Yeah, and tragically for, for that unit, my grandfather's unit, there was 250 men. A third of the unit were actually killed. Uh, in the subsequent evacuation. Well, let's have a look at the working conditions. Let's see why this was so strategically important. Well, we're in the control building of uh, RAF Bougainy, uh, one of only two like it standing in the, uh, in the world. What does it feel like retracing your grandfather Walter's footsteps? I feel a, a real sense of affinity with this building. Um, this is not the first time I've been here, but, you know, in a very tangible way, this was a building that my grandfather knew. He saw it every day that he was stationed here. And for all that the events around my grandfather being here are, are shrouded in disaster, for the period leading up to the evacuation, these were very happy times for, for my grandfather. So, Of course, he and the rest of the, uh, the squadron, his unit, had no idea they were about to be involved in the, the greatest maritime disaster in British history when they left here. It was kind of a, a, a tinge of sadness, I think, that they were leaving. But I think there was an expectation that they would ultimately return. Um, I think for my granddad, uh, for the other men, you know, th th it was a sense of defeat. I mean, you couldn't hide the fact that this was an unmitigated retreat. On the morning of June the 17th, 1940, Captain Sharp in command of Lancastria received an order from the Admiralty. It told him to load as many men as possible without regard to the limits laid down by maritime law. By three o'clock that afternoon, more than 6,000 people, exhausted soldiers, confused refugees, were crowded onto the ship more than three times its established capacity limit. At that point, Captain Sharp made a fateful decision to stay at anchor and not to make a dash for home. He was understandably frightened that without a destroyer escort, his ship would be easy prey to U-boats in the English Channel. A major air raid began at quarter to four, and at 3.48, Lancastria, anchored 10 nautical miles off Saint Nazaire, suffered three direct hits from a squadron of Junker aircraft. Just after four o'clock, Lancastria began to capsize and then sank within 20 minutes. The fuel oil in the sea ignited. The Luftwaffe strafed the survivors in the water. Only five of Lancastria's 32 lifeboats were successfully launched. By the time the smoke had cleared and the the carnage was over. 2,477 people had somehow managed to scramble to safety aboard one of the accompanying ships. The trawler Cambridgeshire, on its own, lifted 900 people from the, the burning water. But even these heroic efforts meant that perhaps 4,000 people had died. Certainly the biggest loss of life in British maritime history perhaps one third of the entire casualty rate of the British Expeditionary Force in France. And the relatives, they were told only that their loved ones had died with the BAF. They were given no more details. Even recently, people have been looking for the remains of their loved ones and found they were buried respectfully in cemeteries like this in Laboule because they'd been washed ashore and weren't cradled in the deep with the Lancastria. Join us after the break to find out more about how Brittany has commemorated the greatest single loss of life in British maritime history. Welcome back. We're telling the story of the Lancastria, the greatest maritime disaster in British history, but one kept secret from the people by a wartime news blackout. But what was the impact of the loss of the Lancastria to the communities here in Brittany? No one knows these waters better than former fisherman and captain of the Loire Pilot Service, Captain Yves Bejuge. As a boy fishing in the estuary, the remains of Lancastria victims were caught in his nets. As a man, he founded the Association Lancastria de France. Captain Yves Bejuge, uh, as president of the uh, Association Lancastria de France, you've made a, 
almost a personal mission to explain the, the circumstances of the loss of that great ship. Effectivement, Alex, tu as entièrement raison. Le but de notre association, c'est premièrement que cette histoire ne soit jamais oubliée. The first aim of the association is that the story can never be forgotten. Then to help the families understand, to know exactly where the site of the shipwreck is. There are 53 cemeteries in the west of France where they are located. And also to give honor to all the victims and survivors of the Lancastria. Et surtout, Alex, c'est pour honorer la mémoire des victimes du Lancastria. Why do you feel that the loss of the Lancastria, the, the greatest loss of life in a, a single ship sinking in the whole of British naval history, why do you feel it's not remembered more as it should be? Effectivement, pour moi, ça restera toujours l'une des premières catastrophes maritimes de tous les temps. Comme je viens de te le dire, 53 cimetières. In fact, for me, it will remain the worst maritime disaster ever. And can you imagine the victim rest in peace in 53 cemeteries? And can you also imagine that exactly six months after the sinking, a body came into Bordeaux? So far, it will remain the worst maritime disaster ever. Maritime, même si nous étions en temps de guerre, ça reste quand même la catastrophe. C'est trois fois pire que le Titanic. Trois fois pire que le Titanic. Et encore, nous ne connaissons pas le nombre. Nous avons juste une estimation du nombre de victimes. Well, Captain, I, I can't thank you for all the work you've done, but uh, what I can do is present you with the Alex Salmond Quay, the loving cup, for being on the show. You know the drill. Vous oh, savez quoi en faire. Sur mon décossé, le whisky. Ah, OK. <laughs> J'adore le whisky écossais, ça va très bien. Merci beaucoup, Alex. Merci, merci beaucoup, de votre merci. visite, c'est très sympathique. Et surtout, merci... Kathleen Tazer has served as a council member of the Saint Lazare with responsibility for veterans' affairs and ceremonies. Madame Kathleen Tazer, what is it about the, the story of the Lancastria which touches the hearts of the, the people of Saint Lazare? Ils sont touchés à plusieurs niveaux parce que l'histoire tout simplement. The situation was very complex on the 17th of June. That's why people do remember this date, because the situation in France was very critical. With Marshal Patin's appeal for the armistice, also because the Allies and troops were going back, people here in Saint-Nazaire were afraid of them leaving. And finally, there was the sinking of the Lancastria, which was a real disaster. People here never forget this huge memory that remains in Saint-Nazaire with the tragedy of the Lancastria de les enterrer dignement et de leur rendre les honneurs. Catherine, for, for all that you've done to commemorate the, the loss of the, the people in Lancaster, can I present you with the Alex Salmon Quay, a loving cup for whiskey. <laughs> Someone de Cosse. You know the drill. Vous savez quoi en faire. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Merci, Merci beaucoup, madame. Merci. One of the most remarkable aspects of the Lancaster disaster is that in many ways it's better remembered in France than it is in Britain. And I'm joined by Claude Vigoro, who's the responsible for the, the Department of the French Government, which looks after veterans affairs in this locality. Tell me a bit about what you, you do locally, Claude. We, we serve the memory of the uh, veterans of uh, uh, several wars, um, and uh, we honour the memory, and uh, we try to uh, help them uh, for social life, uh, orphans, uh, war widows, and uh, victims of terrorism attack too. You've attended many such ceremonies, uh, and uh, as I did have I in other circumstances, a solemnity uh, about the act of remembrance. How do you consider the importance of the act and ceremony of remembrance? Well. It's so uh, important that today Brexit could cut the uh, fidelity in this memory. Or during two world wars, British army and French military were uh, brother in arms. And that is very important. We can't, we mustn't, we never mustn't uh, forget this because um, these people, they die for us, they die for our liberty today. And 
I feel deeply concerned as French by the memory of British uh, military who died uh, for us, with us, for freedom with us. I can't guarantee the continuation of remembrance. I can hope for it, certainly. But what I can offer is the, the quay, the, the loving cup, uh, by which remembrance can be properly acknowledged. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, we have uh, uh, whiskey in the quay oh, and remember you. properly. Thank you very much. Uh, let me offer you such a butler that I led on each grave of British soldier in Vendée. Thank you so much, Claude. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Christoph, this is the uh, Semaphore Museum. And of course, many, many ships have been wrecked in this uh, dangerous coastline. Yeah, really, because uh, before the signals were very, um, very simple, you know, with uh, this mast uh, just behind us, uh, and the light came later. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes with the fog and so on, the ships couldn't see the rocks. Uh -huh. And uh, also there were battles uh, at sea, and there are some, uh, some wrecks here in the area, uh, and uh, also the Lancastria. Please, after you, sir. OK, thank you. This remarkable feature of French remembrance of the Lancastria disaster has also been matched in film. I'm speaking to award-winning film director Christophe Francois, someone who's taken a keen interest in the Lancastria over the years. Christophe, tell us where we are at the present moment. We are here in Pointe Saint-Gilda. It's a South, uh, South Loire region, and uh, we are at the closest uh, point to uh, the shipwreck. We are about um, five nautic miles far from the shipwreck of the Lancastria. And this is the old semaphore station, which has been turned into a very impressive maritime museum, with obviously models of the Lancastria and, and other of the famous ships which were lost off this coast. Yeah, exactly. We are here in this museum in a room which is dedicated to uh, all the sinkings uh, which happened here in the area. And amongst them, uh, we have the model of the Lancastria and some artifacts also, uh, which can show you that it was first a liner. And a very luxurious liner, one of the most exactly. luxurious of its day in the 1930s. Exactly. The Lancastria has uh, had a first life uh, as a liner and uh, transported many, many, many people uh, on cruises. And you made a, an award-winning documentary which was shown across the planet. Tell me what made you make that film which was so noted and so, uh, and so celebrated. First it was shown in France, uh, in our regions, after that on the national network, and after that it was shown in uh, 85 countries which can understand French language. And how did you title the film? I uh, titled the film Lancastria. Uh, the story of a co confidential thinking. Confidential as in secret. Yeah, exactly. It's still uh, difficult to realize today uh, all the victims of this, uh, of this disaster. And uh, I wanted to make something for these unknown victims uh, who died, who perished here in our, our region. And uh, it was the most important for me to make this be known by everybody also in UK. So thank you so much, Christophe for using your craft and filmmaking to properly commemorate those who were lost in Lancaster. And as a small token for appearing on the, the Alex Salmon show, you're entitled to the, the quake. Uh, no, oh, vous yeah, savez quoi, enfin. Exactly. You know the drill. Yeah. Whiskey in the quake. Whiskey et cossé. Yes. The rest is easy. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Bonjour, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. But this lack of official recognition for the victims of Lancaster does not extend to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission here in Pornic, some 30 kilometres from Saint-Nazaire, Christophe Coupe attends to his duties with loving care. Christophe, when was the cemetery here in Pornic first established for the victims of Lancastria? Ce cimetière a été établi à Pornic en premier lieu après le naufrage de Lancastria. The cemetery was established at Pornic after the Lancastria disaster. The first victims were buried in the civil cemetery. But due to the massive number of victims found on the coast, it was decided to bury them here, to dedicate the place to the British soldiers who died here. This is truly a, a beautiful and very peaceful place. And each year a ceremony is still held to commemorate the victims of the Lancastria. Yes, every year since 1946, all the Lancastria victims are remembered in this place by the locals 
the 18th of June 1940 also means the call to resistance for the French from General de Gaulle. I think the, the victims buried here would find that very suitable. Thank you so much. It is perhaps ironic that this commune of Saint-Nazaire should see both the single greatest naval disaster in British history and the most successful commando raid of the Second World War. Here in Saint-Nazaire, both are remembered with touching sensitivity and dignity, but that's not the case back in Blighty. Roger Kipling said to the global empire that they should treat triumph and disaster as twin impostors exactly the same. That message was lost in the British authorities when it came to the sinking, the disastrous loss of Lancastria. And that has caused lasting damage. Firstly, because if warfare is merely a story of triumph, even triumph achieved through sacrifice, then in the words of Robert E. Lee, we risk growing air fond of it. These triumphs have to be balanced in remembrance by the unmitigated disasters, like the loss of Lancastria. Secondly, because behind the loss of 4,000 souls on the Lancastria lay thousands of families who were denied the proper opportunity to commemorate and mourn their loved ones. Indeed, it took the newspapers in America during the Second World War to break what was an effective blackout of the disastrous news of the Lancastria. The Scotsman was the first domestic newspaper to, to break the effective embargo. Other outlets followed, but by then the wartime news agenda had moved on to other things. And then the British authorities, and this is the strangest thing, embarked on what has been a 78-year process of at best grudging acknowledgement of the extent of the Lancastria disaster, and it was what some claim has been a bureaucratic cover-up. However, to every official inaction, there is a people's reaction. And the relatives of those who lost and those who survived in the Lancastria uh, have embarked throughout that period of a campaign to have the memory of their relatives properly commemorated and not lost from history. So join us next week where we talk to survivors and families about their struggle and why the fate of the Lancastria should not be forgotten, lest we forget. Nous n'oublions pas.